Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We're on the road to happiness, a place where happiness was set forth as never before. This is an ancient Roman road thought to go back to the time of Jesus. Some of the ancient pavement is still visible even today. Over there is the Sea of Galilee, and in this other direction is the site traditionally said where Jesus gave the Beatitudes. They're a brief but tantalizing collection of sayings about blessedness or happiness. This would be the road that many took that day and they heard Jesus give his Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes are really just the opening in a small part of that sermon. It was early in his ministry and the reputation of Jesus and reports of his amazing healings were spreading rapidly. So on this road that day would be many sick, crippled and diseased people in search of healing. Others came hoping this young teacher might be the deliverer, the Messiah so many Jewish people longed for and prayed for. At that time, the Roman army was in control here as an occupying force. Poverty was rampant. The common people had a lot to be unhappy about. This program series is primarily for people with cancer. And we've come here to ask, are the Beatitudes for us too? Can happiness and blessedness be found in the midst of cancer, or for that matter, any life trauma? Now, let's face it, we can easily feel about cancer, like so many of the people in Jesus' time felt about the Roman occupation, that it steals our freedom, goes where it wants, takes what it wants, keeps us in submission, just wears us down and humiliates us. It taxes our finances, and it never wants to let us forget day by day that its unrelenting presence controls our lives and limits our future. Yet, it was in such a time and under such conditions that Jesus gave his incomparable words about being blessed and happy and I'm here because I believe those words can help those of us who live with cancer, and perhaps in ways we might never expect. I'm gonna share out of my own experience dealing with advanced cancer, so at times it will get highly personal. When I got hit with a diagnosis of stage 3B lung cancer and kidney cancer, I was told average life expectancy in my situation was about six months with only a 10 to 15% chance to make it a year. But through a combination of traditional and non-traditional treatments, I'm fortunate to now be in my seventh year. They have been tough years, but good years. Four years ago, I was privileged to do a video reflection series on the familiar words of the 23rd Psalm. And then two years ago, a follow-up series on the Lord's Prayer in their special relevance for those struggling with cancer. Those programs were well received and many suggested do another one, this time on the Beatitudes. I saw that we could build beautifully on the previous two and take us to new places. But as I began to prepare for this series, 
The roof fell in on me. A new tumor began to eat away bone at the C6 cervical spine area. I couldn't sleep or even sit up straight. Dr. West warned me that it had reached the point where there was danger of a break and complete paralysis. But fortunately, a series of radiation treatments arrested that deterioration and the bone is being restored. But at the same time, other metastases were found. So I resumed a special form of low-dose chemotherapy that had worked well for me a few years earlier. But the discouragements continued to multiply. A tumor had clamped onto the pulmonary artery and an additional tumor grew rapidly to the size of a brick in my lower right abdominal area. These all had to be treated and like most cancer therapies, they take a toll far beyond what you ever expect. My doctors and I had doubt that I could ever come back here and do this program. So I can't begin to tell you how happy and blessed I am just to be able to come here to share this program with you. That's because the Beatitudes helped me so much to respond to my own cancer. For me, it's made all the difference. So here we are in the very vicinity where according to tradition, the Beatitudes were originally uttered. Just up at the top of the hill is a church that honors these words that some consider the most profound ever uttered by anyone at any time and where they were originally spoken. Now, they're only a brief collection of about 165 words and it's important to realize what they are not. They're not just pretty poetry, not self-help advice, not philosophical speculation, not psychological counseling. They're not some kind of magical formula to wish our problems and sufferings away. Rather, they are just brief, straightforward, bold statements that press us to ask, do I really want to know what matters most in life? How do I deal with the matters of my heart? Am I ready to align myself with the purposes for which God gave me life? Now, please understand this. The Beatitudes are not a cafeteria or smorgasbord to pick and choose the ones we like. No, they're a package deal. They're interconnected like a chain. The individual links form a unified whole. And where are they taking us? Let me say at least what I see as our purpose. What we will be dealing with is finding blessedness out of our brokenness. To find that blessedness, we'll linger at fascinating places here in the Holy Land where the Beatitudes were originally given. We're on a journey into the meaning of blessedness, and I hope you'll discover with me how they fit just right as we take on what I admit sounds at first like a ridiculous task, but I assure you a most wonderful one to find blessedness out of our brokenness. The first beatitude, let's admit it, this is a tough one. Frankly, it sounds more like a bane than a blessing. To be poor in spirit means to be humbled, to be brought low. And to think about this, I've come to the lowest place on earth. This is the Dead Sea. It's over 1,300 feet below sea level. It's 42 miles long and 11 miles at its widest point and you won't see any fishermen down there. Fish don't live in this water. And when you go into these waters, you dare not let any get in your eyes because it really burns. 
the salt content is about 30 percent or 10 times what you normally find in the ocean. My first impression was that this is a most unfriendly, hot, and uncomfortable place. But after a while, it begins to feel quite different. Two words now come to me at this place, and these are words, incidentally, that I've now come to see related to all the Beatitudes. Those two words are beautiful and bountiful. This place is beautiful to me in so many ways. I love to swim. In fact, I try to swim every day. I've even been called an aquaholic. But I'll tell you, there's no place on earth like this that I've ever found where you can engage the water and relate to it in such a dreamlike way. The water here gives you buoyancy and support that's almost surreal. And for me at least, it's a kind of consciousness altering experience. Who knows, maybe at some level it's like a return to the womb. This mud is very rich with a mineral. Mineral, yeah. yeah. And it's very healthy for everything, like a skin, a muscle, a bones. Beautiful and bountiful also, and that nature gives great gifts here. Gifts that draw people from all over the world, now as well as in ancient times. For example, Kings David, Solomon, and Herod. Also, Aristotle, Cleopatra, the Queen of Sheba. Then and now, people come to experience the unique healing properties and aids to beauty from these waters. And when we come to that low place of being poor in spirit, even though we never expected it first, that can also become for us a place of beauty and bounty. You know, cancer patients often have a good head start in learning about humility and poverty of spirit. We've been brought low. We move through a rocky wasteland. So many of our illusions and our complacencies have been completely shattered. In the lonely hours of the night, we sometimes grasp that frightful awareness that I am not the center of the universe. In fact, the world may soon have to go on without me. You know, the world can go on without me. Indeed, the world will go on without me. I am not indispensable. And oh, how that can yank us back to ask. Ask as we never have before. Why am I here? What is my life all about? That kind of awareness hit me so emotionally soon after I was first diagnosed. I felt like I was thrust out into a vast unknown. You've heard that supposedly funny line for cancer patients, those that are given just a brief time to go home, get your affairs in order, don't buy any green bananas, and it's okay to tell the tax man or your boss what you really think of him. Well, Soon after my diagnosis, I went to the lawyer's office with family members to see what it meant for me to get my affairs in order. I felt so spaced out. I was there. I heard everything. I answered their questions. I tried so hard to look interested, but it was as if I were in another room behind a glass wall. I was there, but I wasn't there. My world had already gone away. Or had I gone away? So much had changed beyond recognition in the way I felt or couldn't feel about my life. But I found this state of numbness eventually passes. It can be a prelude to a place of great discovery for when we know that our time on this earth is limited and we don't have all the answers and we've so messed up, and we probably haven't done all we might have with our lives. In that poverty of spirit, we may be ready as never before to receive the kingdom of God. So being weak and wounded in spirit does not have to mean that we're finished. It could mean that we're on the verge of a brand new beginning, 
a place where our hearts can open to that which far exceeds anything we've known before. The poor in spirit are humbled before the creator of the universe and the giver of life. We've come to the place where we can uniquely tune into his wavelength. I love the words of John Bunyan, the author of The Pilgrim's Progress, who said, He that is down need fear no fall. We don't need to worry about losing anything anymore. We fear we've nothing left to lose. The way up may start when we're most down. Poverty of spirit can become the path to true and new self-awareness, a realization of who we really are, where we've come from, even why we were born. So this first beatitude causes us to flip the usual way of looking at things. Poverty of spirit does not have to degrade us as nothing else. It may actually ennoble us. In fact, true poverty of spirit may come when we have caught a glimpse of the glory of God and the beauty of His holiness. In such a privileged place, we see our true smallness by comparison. And at the same time, paradoxically and wonderfully, we can then see something of our own true greatness. We've been brought to the threshold of receiving the greatest gift of all. For blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of God. If our first beatitude, happy or blessed are the poor in spirit, if that was a tough one, then this second one at first sure doesn't look any easier. Blessed are they that mourn. I mean, why not just say, happy are those who are sad? To consider this, I've come here to the Judean desert. This is the Mount of Temptation where Jesus fasted for 40 days and was tempted and tested to such limits that the scriptures tell us that angels even came to attend him. This is such a harsh and desolate place. And we're here to ask if we can make any sense of our beatitude that speaks of blessedness out of mourning. So what is mourning? I think of it as our response to lack or to loss. Cancer can make us so painfully aware of the lack of health and loss of capabilities that once served us well and that we so often took for granted. So, of course we mourn. Things are out of kilter, they're not as they should be. We might even dare to say, not as God intended. So, how can we possibly think of mourning as good or blessed? Well, let's at least begin by agreeing that far more to be pitied are those who cannot mourn, those who are cold, hardened, unresponsive, like a dead body. Not to mourn can be tragic. If we grow numb and insensitive to the suffering and pain around us, then really, what's left of our humanity? We cannot be honest and truly face the depths of our own heart and how short we have fallen and not mourn. A healthy mourning implies engagement and can so often reveal compassion. Maybe it comes down to something quite simple. Those who know how to mourn know how to feel. And some would tell us that if we have the capacity to feel, then we have the potential to heal. Now here's a key. Our beatitude reminds us that it's where we're looking and what we're expecting that's so important. What a difference it makes if, in the midst of our distress, we can look ahead and know this too shall pass. One way or another, 
I'm going to get through this. I will find comfort. Now folks, out here in this barren wilderness, it can be pretty uncomfortable, but I found a wonderful surprise in a great comfort just a few steps away where I'm going to take you now. I'll tell you, I find it so hard to imagine Jesus spending 40 days and 40 nights out in this wilderness. I've been here an hour, and I'll tell you, the thirst is overwhelming. Your throat gets so parched. And for me, right now, the meaning of comfort is a cool, refreshing drink. And thankfully, I've come to just the right place to find that. What's your name? Fattis. Ferris, yes. can I have some pomegranate juice? Okay. Great. Is that right? Put it like that. Yeah. Okay. Why did you think I couldn't do it? Yeah. yeah. I wish I could take these home with me. Pomegranate juice. Well, Ferris, what we're showing here is how right next to the very dry and stark mountainside, you have beautiful flowers and fruits and oasis. So can we go out back and, and see a little bit? Thank you for letting us go right through your house. And uh, we won't interrupt your family here. The flowing river from the mountain. Fresh water, clean, pure, cold. We found the oasis. They shall be comforted. Look at this. We found our oasis, and we're literally right next to the desert. And here we have this flowing stream of cool, wonderful, refreshing water. That's just such a pleasure to be in. What a relief. They shall be comforted. For another view of the oasis, I took a cable car ride from Jericho up to the top of the Mount of Temptation. Jericho not only has the distinction of being the oldest continually inhabited city in the world, but it has for millennia been a deliciously fruitful garden in the midst of a forbidding desert. The dividing line can be seen so clearly from this vantage point. It's such an unusual place, and I've come to liken it to our beatitude. In the midst of the barren wasteland, here is a haven of refreshment. And in the midst of our mourning, there are times when comfort indeed may be found. Now, there's no easy answer guaranteeing our problems will be magically solved or our losses restored, but we're assured that in the midst of our mourning, we will find comfort. We're shown in Scripture that God himself mourns with us. In all their distress, he too was distressed, said the prophet Isaiah. When Jesus said, they shall be comforted, he used the word paraclete. That's the root word used to describe the Holy Spirit as the comforter, the one who comes alongside us. And I'll tell you, that has to make all the difference. You know, for some, loneliness and isolation are even more distressing than the disease. One thing worse than suffering is to suffer alone. I think the comfort promised us has to do with the presence of God alongside us and inside us, even when our sense of loss is so devastating. Ferris has let me come outside in his backyard, right beside the oasis here and his beautiful trees and the refreshing shade and time for another pomegranate juice. And let me use this time to tell you about the most overpowering sense of loss in my cancer pilgrimage. This is the one that I felt most deeply because it almost cost me my life. Came a year ago. 
I was recovering from the maximum doses of radiation and 15 new rounds of low-dose chemo. Now, these treatments can do a job on you. They leave you so weak. I had no idea how weak. I said last time how I've been an avid swimmer since a teenager. So, after all those treatments, I felt it was time to begin my swimming again. I was in Florida and I found a calm place on the inland waterway on the Gulf of Mexico. Went in for a swim and I thought I started off well. That's until I turned to reverse direction. I quickly realized I wasn't going back, no matter how hard I tried. The tide was going out of the inland waterway and was dumping back into the Gulf like water out of a bathtub drain. I felt helpless. No matter how hard I struggled, I could not make progress back. My arms were heavy as lead. My lungs were burning. I was gasping for air. Somehow, I was able to angle sideways and head in and cling on to a huge rock. And there, I struggled to catch my breath. From somewhere, and I don't know where, a man came along and assisted me back in. I was bleeding heavily from being scraped against the rock, but that wasn't the real hurt. It was such a shattering experience for me because for years I had been the rescuer, the one who as a youth had set racing records, who still teaches others to swim even today. And now I had lost it. I needed to be rescued. It made me think of cancer as being like that tidal current pulling us relentlessly out into the choppy waters of the open sea. For days, I was stunned by this physical, emotional, even spiritual experience. Since that swimming incident, I've regained some strength and stamina, and I'm back in the water, but it's not like before. I kept wondering, when will I get back to normal? Until I realized it's never going to get back to normal. And one day I came to accept how it's really okay to mourn the painful losses. We've all heard the phrase, a new normal. We can find a change in perspective and make the adjustments to go forward. No, it'll never be the same as before. There's going to be limitations. But happily, there will be new advantages new ways of coping, and that will bring its own different satisfactions. This as we come to delight in the comforter who comes alongside us. So the key, I think, is not to choke off and repress our mourning, but to face it, even affirm it, but then to speak to it and tell our hurt and our grief to move over now and to make room in our heart for the joy, the blessedness, the comfort that we're now going to claim and eagerly embrace. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, are you thinking, here we go again? Another beatitude that at first just doesn't seem to make any sense at all. How many people do you know that would like to be known as meek? Not many, I'm sure, because meek is seen as weak. The meek person is assumed to be a wimp. But here again, as we look just a little closer, we find the usual way of looking at things can be so far out of whack. Meekness actually can reveal a hidden strength, a quiet confidence, a beautiful pathway to blessedness. The meek aren't the losers that we might expect. In fact, it turns out they're going to be the big winners. It's the meek who will inherit the earth. 
two people in the Bible are noted for their meekness. One is Moses, indisputably one of the greatest leaders in all history. He's the one God used to deliver the Jews out of slavery in Egypt. And the other, of course, is Jesus. In his life and teaching, we could find so much about what meekness really means. An extraordinary demonstration of the meekness of Jesus took place here by the Sea of Galilee. After his resurrection, clothed in his new glorified body, Jesus came here to seek out the very disciples who earlier had panicked and abandoned him as he faced the crucifixion. The account is in the Gospel of John. It was after a long and frustrating night of fishing seven of the disciples had caught nothing. So Jesus begins by having a little fun. He yells out from shore to cast your nets on the other side of the boat. And they do. And they immediately pull in 153 fish. They rush into shore and they see Jesus had prepared a hot breakfast for them of bread and fish. Now, he did not use the occasion to taunt them or humiliate them for their cowardice. Instead, he restores them to his friendship and to his love. What a demonstration of the quiet strength of pure meekness. And at the very same time, he redirects their futures in a way that they were never the same. Jesus spoke about meekness in one of my favorite passages of scripture, Matthew 11:29. There he invites anyone, just as he did the disciples by these shores, to have a brand new start. He said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is a carpenter shop in Nazareth Village, just like it would have been when Jesus was growing up. As the son of a carpenter, he no doubt learned how to make yokes for the animals. And that brings us to a key point. It's one we touched on in a previous section, that the invitation of Jesus is not to a magical solution to all our problems. He speaks of our bearing his yoke. In essence, exchanging one yoke for another. And who wants to bear a yoke? But the point is not whether we're going to bear a yoke. Inevitably we will. The question is, what yoke are we going to bear? As for the yoke of Jesus, he doesn't sugarcoat what's going to happen, but he fashions that yoke so it fits just right for us. Even the very words of his invitation put us so much at ease. Come unto me, he says. There, he shows himself approachable, caring, and eager to relate to us. And the invitation to bear his yoke is so masterfully attuned to our deepest needs. There's no escape into some mystical realm. What can be more physical than a yoke? Now, it takes into account that we live in physical bodies but it trains our minds as well as our bodies. The yoke of Jesus moves us into an endless adventure of learning and discovery. And for the cancer patient, part of that discovery, paradoxically, includes learning a new awareness of the gift of our bodies. How amazing, how frail, how complex. We come to marvel even in our infirmity at the words of the psalm that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. His yoke also brings a spiritual tranquility that we so deeply long for. 
you shall find rest for your souls. And notice who he invites. He welcomes the exhausted, those who are emotionally spent, those who are heavy laden. In my recent time of overpowering weakness, it actually reached the embarrassing point where one day I had to ask my granddaughter to twist a bottle cap off for me. I realized then that for me, the yoke meant that I had to take some time. And you know, it turned out to be five or six months and I just had to stop. I had to refocus my fragile life and center around three words, wait, rest, and love. And there was so much I needed to learn from Christ about the meaning of all three of those words. Now, in the midst of such weakness, as we learn from him, we find that his yoke isn't a curse. It's not an unbearable load. It's really a helpful guide. His yoke changes our burdens to become our bliss. It changes our limitations to actually become our liberation. And those who accept it in meekness are being prepared for nothing less than to inherit the earth. We return to the shore of the Sea of Galilee where Jesus appeared in his glorified, resurrected body to make that breakfast that we talked about earlier. Now, we don't know much about what heaven will be like, but the scriptures teach that those who want to follow the Lord and want to open themselves to his grace will be given a transformed body like his after death. Now, do you see what this means in practical terms? Nothing less than this. We can refuse to let a cancer diagnosis define us or our bodies. We've already been defined. We're part of the family of Jesus and part of the glorified, transformed humanity that he's already promised. And that glorified humanity in new bodies will in the fullest sense inherit the earth. We can only bow in awe before such a prospect. And through that very posture and attitude, we already begin to inherit the earth. Today we're at Qumran. We're near the caves where the astounding Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947 by a young shepherd boy who was looking for a stray goat. These scrolls provided evidence for the incredibly accurate transmission of the biblical text over many centuries. The scrolls came from a very devout community. They were known as Essenes. They lived here before and during the time of Jesus. It's thought John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, may actually have been one of the Essenes. And here we are in the remains of their community. They probably hid their library of scrolls in these nearby caves so they wouldn't be destroyed by the Romans during the Jewish revolt in 69 AD. Think of it, little could this devout community have ever dreamed what a spiritual and scholarly treasure they were leaving to the world. I find that such a potent reminder that we often have no idea of the ultimate impact of our own lives and often in ways we could never expect. The Essenes lived austere lives here. In their own way, they were hungering and thirsting after righteousness. They were awaiting the teacher of righteousness and the Messiah. I'm here by one of the mikveh, or spiritual baths, here at Qumran. 
they're such a reminder of how important ritual purity was to this community. Now let's face it, their way of life is not a practical option for most of us today. And this whole idea of hungering after righteousness, it can sound so sticky, so uncomfortably religious. That is, until we realize Jesus is not talking about those who think they're righteous. He's talking about those who know that they are not, who know they fall short. Otherwise, why would they hunger and thirst after it? While widespread physical hunger is such a scandal in our world today, there is a spiritual hunger that can be absolutely glorious. It won't seem so at first. In fact, it's more likely to feel like a barren, abandoned wilderness like this place where the Essenes withdrew to set up their community. But in our spiritual wilderness, we may tremble under the testing, but later move on to the blessings of the promised land. In the Old Testament, Moses told the people of Israel to remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you to see what was in your heart. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna. He was teaching you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Does God let people go hungry? Well, at least in this case, it says he did. And no less than the people that he loved, the ones he miraculously delivered out of slavery, the ones he set apart with a calling to bless the entire world, those are the very people he taught that there's a time to hunger for that which is more than food. Man shall not live by bread alone. That's the passage Jesus quoted when he was fasting in the wilderness and tempted by Satan. People coping with chronic disease and pain often find that they too are just thrust into a wilderness and they come to be sustained by that which is not physical and yet can only find it when the hunger and the thirst is as intense as if it were physical. As we imagine the living conditions for the Essenes out here in the hot and barren desert, we're reminded that hungering and thirsting after righteousness is no fun. Our desert can be the time when we feel so empty, so bereft of God's presence, so hypocritical to even seek God in righteousness, knowing how far we've fallen short. We think of our worthy aspirations, but we see our meager results. But there is an assurance here that it is in the times of hunger and thirst that we are filled. This has a direct bearing on those who are suffering and those whose lives hang in the balance for it's a time when we're just so prone to ask, where is God? What does he expect of me? And even if I knew what he wanted, how could I possibly fulfill it now in this weakened condition? Now, I'm not talking about the angry accusations of the one who is suffering and taunts God with, how can you stand by and do nothing? Or, if you're good, why did you let this happen to me? Or, if you're all powerful, God, then why don't you fix things for me right away? No, I'm talking about the one who can now ask, even in the midst of suffering and weakness, how could I have been so blind to my blessings? How could I have wasted so much time in trivial things? What might my life have been like if I had sought God much earlier and put him first? We come to see that we have no claims in God's sight. We've got no basis to make demands of him. And wonderfully, it seems when we come to this point that what we lack he provides. We realize we can believe and trust him. We can still find what we're gifted to be and fulfill what is still possible, even in our limited circumstances. We can give back to God whatever we are, 
no matter how weak and diminished we feel, for Him to use as He wishes. Prominent cancer doctor and medical school professor, Dr. Lodovico Balducci, says that what makes our lives worthy is a sense of mission. Each person, including cancer patients, finding their unique calling. He explains, each of us has something equally important within us, something only we can do. A life gains meaning only when it is spent pursuing that special task. And he adds, he has seen so many die with peace of mind to have accomplished what was expected from them, to have left a print on this earth that may be forgotten, but not erased. So our greatest legacy is found in giving what is uniquely ours to give, touching those who are uniquely ours to touch, and becoming what we are uniquely called to be. You know, maybe it all comes down to this. To hunger and thirst after righteousness is to want more than anything else what God wants. And that means to find our special calling and to follow that calling, even if it's in our dying days, or better, in our living days. There, we find that uniqueness and a rightness, a righteousness. And I think part of what it means to be filled and fulfilled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Perhaps one of the greatest examples of the meaning of Blessed Are the Merciful is the story of the Good Samaritan. It happened on the desolate road from Jerusalem to Jericho. One day, a man traveling that road was beaten up, robbed, thrown aside, and left to die. Two respected religious officials came along, but they didn't want to get involved, so they just continued and walked on past. Then a Samaritan businessman came along. The Samaritans were a despised half-breed that were looked down upon by Jesus' fellow Jews. The Samaritan stopped. He gave the man first aid. He put him on his donkey and brought him to a nearby inn. There, he arranged for room, medical attention, meals, and even paid the cost. He also promised to cover any additional cost until the man got well. This story of mercy has become a lasting standard of decency and compassion. And many states in America actually have what are called Good Samaritan laws that have to do with showing mercy to people in danger or distress. Now, here's what's interesting. The story doesn't tell us if the man deserved mercy and kindness, or if he ever showed appreciation or if he made any attempt to even pay back part of the cost. The whole story is about the mercy of one person compared to the cold hearts of others who just could not be bothered to help. This simple little beatitude, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy, is both a promise and it's an implied threat. The promise, of course, is that those who are merciful will obtain mercy, but the implication is that those who are not merciful will not. It's really a profound call for self-examination. It prompts us to ask how merciful we truly are and how aware and grateful we are for the mercy that we have received. 
And we have all received far more mercy than we ever begin to realize. Those who cannot or will not see the mercy that they have received most likely are not going to be all that quick to extend any mercy to others. So who are the merciful? Well, among other things we can say, the merciful are those who truly care. And does caring really make any difference? Well, let me ask you this. Do you care if your doctor cares? How much does the degree that you think your doctor cares build your own hope and your confidence? And does this have anything to do with your healing possibilities? Yes, of course it does. Francis W. Peabody was a renowned doctor. His biographer titled him the caring physician. He died of cancer at age 45. In October of 1925, he spoke to students at Harvard Medical School and he concluded with this timeless truth that the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. So why do we want a doctor who is more than a mechanic, one who genuinely cares? Well, when there is caring, there's a different kind of personal presence, a more attentive tuning into you, and you can feel it. When there's caring, your whole sense of self-worth and the value of your life is affirmed. Cancer can take an awful toll on how we look at ourselves. Sometimes we even come to ask, why am I so damaged and defective? But the one who cares, whether a physician, friend, or family member, has such a vital role in lifting our battered sense of self. They have that great power to give emotional assurance that your life is still important and that it means something. In preparing these thoughts, I realized how I've neglected to adequately thank doctors who've genuinely cared for me. So I felt it important to get on that because doctors today live with incredible pressures. They're squeezed between insurance companies, lawyers, giant pharmaceutical firms, and at the same time, they have to deal daily with emotionally stressed patients. So rarely do they get a thank you, and they need it as much as we all do. And it's a mercy that we can pass on ahead to other patients. For when we affirm the caring doctor in an extra way, he or she is going to be even more caring for the next patient. But I would suggest to you that the greatest and most healing mercy of all still remains the mercy of God. I've stopped on the way to Jericho outside an Orthodox monastery they say it's been here for 1,500 years. And for 1,500 years, Orthodox Christians have used a simple prayer that's now being increasingly embraced in ever wider circles. It's to quietly, reverently, and thoughtfully repeat, Jesus Christ, Son of God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It's so short, but profound. What incredible faith that presumes one can actually come and talk to God like this. Think of the amazing courage to come before him and openly confess our sinfulness. And consider the enormous hope that clearly expects God looks with mercy on those who do so humbly come before him. But the beatitude points us beyond the mercy that we seek for ourselves to the mercy that we extend to others. For cancer patients, we become understandably preoccupied with our own struggles. It often seems that all our energy needs to be consumed on ourselves. But how important in the midst of our own hurt and uncertainty to just let our hearts reach out to others. And something mysterious happens when we're able to reach out in love and caring to other patients or to those in whatever distress or need. Beyond any benefit to them, to love and care for others, somehow primes an inner pump. It charges up our own supply 
of life-giving energy. I've been so blessed and inspired by people I've met in the cancer world, people who know how to receive mercy, but also how to show mercy. They've led me to believe that one of the most profound and helpful sources of healing are fellow patients. Lynn Thompson's husband died suddenly in an auto accident, leaving her with four young daughters. Two and a half years later, in 1983, she was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. She went through a double mastectomy and six months of chemotherapy. But today, Lynn is coordinator of Journey of Hope for the Cancer Treatment Centers of America. She runs two websites for cancer patients, and she's trained hundreds of local churches in how to minister to cancer patients. Over 20 years ago, Greg Anderson was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and he was told he had 30 days to live. But Greg refused to accept the death sentence and his life now reaches multitudes as founder and head of the Cancer Recovery Foundation, a multifaceted work that includes ministering to children with cancer. Lynn Ibe, faced the demands of surgery and chemo for stage three colon cancer over 20 years ago. And out of her experience, she's written practical and outstanding books for cancer patients, in addition to her wonderful work as a patient advocate. Margaret Delancey was diagnosed with cancer over eight years ago. She also lives with a serious heart condition but a few years back, she formed a group in her local church that prays for and assists literally hundreds of cancer patients every month. Each one of these was wonderfully spared and each one has touched thousands of lives. Now, maybe we won't touch thousands of lives, but we all come across our own Jericho Road our own special place and role where our mercy is needed. Indeed, how blessed are the merciful. They too inevitably receive mercy, even as they untiringly extend it. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. His end was drawing near and he knew it. He stopped here on the way down the Mount of Olives and paused over the glorious overview of the city. It would have been even more striking then because the magnificent temple was still standing. The Gospel of Luke tells us, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. What a powerful demonstration of what might be meant by pure in heart. This was a time we would expect Jesus to be obsessed with his own survival and safety, but instead his heart is moved by the tragic future that he foresaw for the city and its people, and it reduced him to tears. The church here, known as Dominus Flavit, means the Lord wept, and it memorializes that poignant moment. It's built in the shape of a teardrop that symbolizes how his compassion for his people transcended even his own self-interest in survival. But there's an even greater example of pure in heart. It's just down below us, the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane moves me as no other place in the Holy Land. The trees here are amazing. No one knows how old they are. Olive trees don't have rings like other trees to reveal their age, so some claim these trees are as much as 1,500 years old. We know a little of what went on here near the end of Jesus' life. 
but there is so much we don't know. But Christians understand that his struggle here was for nothing less than the fate and the souls of all humanity. In the garden, we found Jesus agonizing in a cosmic struggle. It wasn't just a scared man facing death. It was a man facing the burden of sin of humanity. He was taking nothing less upon himself. And we can only begin to imagine what it must have been like for him to face that prospect. No wonder he cringed and said to God, isn't there any other way? In the midst of his agony, I wonder if he ever looked over from here to see the pinnacle of the temple. That's where Satan tempted him at the very beginning of his ministry. And in pureness of heart, he refused that temptation. Let me tell you how pureness of heart has been very meaningful in my own cancer experience. Not through any pureness of my own heart, but that of others who sought God on my behalf, and I think saw something of God and His presence as a result. Greg Humphreys is a businessman in Virginia. For years, he's prayed every day when he arises at dawn for me and the Christian media ministry I oversee. Since I was diagnosed with cancer, he's continued those prayers and pressed upon me that he was convinced there was much left for me to do, such as programs like this. Nadia Lawand lost her husband on the operating table for what should have been a routine hernia operation. Then her 35-year-old daughter was murdered on a street in Miami just weeks before she was to take up a teaching post at Harvard University. These heartbreaks did not make her bitter, but drove her to seek God more intimately and to devote her life to prayer for others. When she learned of my cancer, she was moved to sometimes fast and daily pray for me that I would be spared. She would call me often and tell me how she could see me in her mind's eye as well and strong and following a new path of service that God was opening up for me. Soon after I was diagnosed and in that state of being overwhelmed and confused, a leading cancer center advised me to immediately start heavy duty chemo and radiation. They said to resign my job. Coping with cancer would now be my full-time vocation. And they didn't give me very good odds of making it. At this time, unknown to me, two family members spent three days fasting and praying for me. One woke at the end of the fast at 3 a.m. in the morning. He was obsessed with a word he had heard on a CD days before about an alternative cancer treatment. He rushed to the computer, did an internet search, and found therapies that I am convinced saved my life. Now, there was no dramatic spiritual experience, but in each of these examples, through their pureness of heart and selfless caring, I'm convinced we saw something of God in his leading. As I see it, pureness of heart, for some cancer patients at least, and that includes me, might mean being open and willing to question the accepted wisdom. And that leads me to say something I do only with great hesitation, because I am not a doctor, and I can speak only from the underside of personal experience. But I know I would not be here today were it not for medical science and some of the standard medical treatments. But at the same time, and equally important, in fact, possibly more important, I know I would not be here today if I had relied only on medical science and standard cancer treatments. I have great respect for doctors, but I also realize that there is more that doctors do not know about cancer than what they do know. I've come to believe that for many of us, to have the best chance to thrive in the midst of cancer, we come to a point where we simply have to take charge. 
take charge even though we are frightfully aware that we're not in control. Is this making any sense? I never try to tell anyone how to have their cancer treated, except for this. God has given us an immune system, and it normally and routinely takes on the cancer cells that develop in all of us. So no matter what treatment you decide to accept, do everything you possibly can to strengthen your own immune system so it can better do what only it can do. Now that may include many things, such as nutrition, aggressive detoxification, exercise, rest, prayer, forgiveness, reducing stress, even reorienting your life as needed. Pureness of heart for me meant leaving the security of letting the experts make all the calls. Yes, I have to respectfully work with them, but at the same time, bear that burden to take charge, even if I feel like I'm not in control. As a result, I have no doubt that I saw through a glass darkly something of God's face and leading through tumultuous and uncharted waters. The promise given to the pure in heart is that they shall see God. And those I mentioned who sought God on my behalf did see something of God as he led us in the most unexpected ways. And I think of it like this. We were made to see God. And when we can see God, or perhaps when others can see God on our behalf, then can we not live with anything and find the strength to face whatever confronts us? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I'm at the little town of Bethlehem. This is the place we sing about every Christmas Eve when we proclaim the hopes and fears of all the years I met in thee tonight. Here is where a choir of angels announced the birth of Jesus and to a most unlikely group. They were, after all, just humble shepherds and they were the first invited guests to visit the newborn. When the angels came, they gave the lowly shepherds a promise and a message of peace, peace on earth to those of good will. But this idea of peace on earth is a tough one. This very ground is part of the West Bank in the Holy Land. It's a place that knows way too much conflict. But the first thing that the angel said to the shepherds that night was, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. The command given most frequently in all the Bible is simply this, fear not, or do not be afraid. And it comes at so many of the major turning points in the Bible. They are the words given, for example, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joshua, Daniel also to Mary, and later to Joseph, and to the shepherds, and to the women who came to the tomb of Jesus and found his body was missing. Over and over, Jesus himself spoke the same assurance to his disciples, to the multitudes, to those who were sick. We might even say that the grand underlying theme of the Bible is to not be afraid. And it's clear that transcending fear and finding peace 
go hand in hand together. In dealing with cancer, it's perhaps as important as any medicine or treatment that we take. One of the great pictures in the Bible that points in this direction is the transformation of weapons of war into instruments of peace. The book of Isaiah speaks of a time when nations will no longer go to war, a time when they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. This is the kind of plow that Jesus would likely have worked on in his father's carpenter shop. And the beautiful image of converting swords into plowshares conveys the radical vision that the attitude, ingenuity, the investment that we pour into weapons of destruction instead be put into instruments of peace. The weapons of war, war at so many levels, are so often fashioned out of fear. So a key question becomes, how do we face our fears and work to change them into instruments of peace? For those of us dealing with cancer or those terrified of getting cancer, this becomes very practical and personal. And here's why. Cancer is commonly presented to us as a war. President Nixon declared an expensive war on cancer way back in 1971. Well, guess what, folks? That war has not yet been won. After decades, it's still raging on. And some experts now tell us that over one of every three people will be diagnosed with some kind of cancer in their lifetime every year over $14 billion is spent on cancer research. Since President Nixon declared the war on cancer in 1971, some $200 billion has been sent on research to cure cancer. And the so-called survival gains are more often measured in additional months of life for the patient rather than years. And of course, the cancer war goes on at both a societal in the personal level. We hear all the time of someone who died after a strong and heroic battle or prolonged fight against their cancer. My friends, what I'm going to confess now is not medical advice in any way. It's only my personal testimony, and it's this. I guess I've gone a wall. I refuse to look any longer on my cancer as a war front. I no longer see myself as a soldier in the trenches of the cancer conflict. I have no desire whatever to end up as a shattered corpse on some cancer battlefield. As I've come to see it, if we are in a battle or a war with cancer, then it has to be a brutal civil war. We're fighting ourselves. So my outlook has gradually and I think radically changed. Instead of seeing cancer as a battle, I seek to treat it as a conversation. That's where I need to listen to what cancer has been telling me, telling me about my body, my lifestyle, and some pretty serious changes I've needed to make. And just as important as listening to the body is talking to our bodies telling it what's happening, what's coming, and what we need to ask of it. Further, I've come to see cancer as a kind of classroom of our amazing bodies. I'm continually learning more and more about how, as the Bible so wonderfully puts it, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Also, it's a time of cooperation. How much we need to work with our immune system to support it to do the job 
that it can do better than any medicine. So more and more, what that means for me is this. It's a time of communication between soul and body. And that extends even down to the cellular level of the body. Now I'm so concerned that I'm clear that I'm not in any way talking about our giving up or resignation. It's really just the opposite. What I'm talking about is perhaps a new kind of acceptance, engagement, and cooperation. I think what I'm trying to get at was well put in Anne Lamott's book, Traveling Mercies. It's about a man with lung cancer, and it had metastasized to his brain. He said how, I'm now so savoring the moments of my life, and I'm so acutely aware of love and small pleasures that I no longer feel that I have a life-threatening disease, but rather I have a disease-threatening life. This has become for me the way of faith, to face the cancer issue with confidence, a confidence that God will give the grace to transcend or the strength to endure. And whatever comes, it can be faced with peace and with confidence, rather than with shattered nerves or unrelenting stress or that paralyzing fear that comes from the battlefield mentality. Now, I grant you, this is a big, complicated, and quite uncharted territory. And frankly, it runs counter to the entrenched battlefield metaphors. And if by now you're wondering, have I got some kind of screw loose? Let me just observe this. Yes, it is strange to imagine a world without war, or to see cancer as something other than a war zone. But the biblical vision is nothing less than to see our swords turned into plowshares, our battlefields into beautiful and fruitful olive groves. We become what we behold. What vision do you prefer? Which is more worthy? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. We've seen some strange ideas set forth as blessed or happy in the Beatitudes thus far. And now this final one is no less surprising. In fact, it sounds almost absurd, perhaps even a cruel mockery, for it goes on to tell us to rejoice and be glad in the face of persecution and suffering. So live a righteous life, expect to suffer for it, and be happy about it? And isn't it peculiar that this beatitude follows immediately after those that talk about the pure in heart and the peacemakers? Why would such as those be the ones to pay such a heavy price in terms of persecution and suffering? And by the way, we know that some of those followers of Jesus who were present when he first gave this message, they ended up even paying with their lives for their devotion to him. Well, it's a tough one, and to try to think about it, I'm at a very interesting place. Let me show you this. Across the valley over there, beyond the old Jerusalem city wall, is the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was arrested at the Garden of Gethsemane. He was taken this short distance to where we are now, and then brought up these steps where we're approaching at the moment.
These are said to be the very steps where they took Jesus after he was arrested to appear before the chief priest Caiaphas at his palace. At the top, we enter the holding cell in the basement where the prisoners were detained. I've sometimes thought of cancer as a prison sentence or a death sentence, but in this prison I could only think of the supreme irony of Jesus locked up here beneath the earth, the one who had gone about bringing life, healing, freedom, and deliverance is now held captive and persecuted by jealous and self-righteous men. But for now, we're not going to get into the matter of persecution directly. We'll look instead at a related sub-theme, that of unjust suffering. It's an issue people with cancer often face. We ask, why did this happen to me? What did I do? Am I being punished? How unfair that I get this tragic disease when others who live far worse lives, they seem to get off untouched. So what about unjust suffering? How can God allow it? This might be the oldest, biggest, nastiest question in the world. And how concerned we get about God's reputation. We struggle to find excuses for God. We feel we need to get him off the hook, as it were. But recall how in the greatest story on suffering ever written, that of Job in the Old Testament, there's no final answer or explanation given. And Job was a righteous man. He didn't suffer because he was bad. The story indicates he suffered because he was good. And Job didn't deserve to lose all his family, his business, his possessions, his health, the support of his friends. In the story, it's quite clear that while God did not send the tremendous tragedies that piled in on him, at the same time, God wasn't taken by surprise either. In fact, God even allowed it. But in the end, God worked through it, restored Job, and turned his life into far more than it was at the beginning. He showed Job a much larger picture, one that was impossible to see in the midst of the turmoil. In other words, there was a story behind the story. And we too are caught up in a much larger story in which our present and our immediate experience are only a small part. As one dear friend wrote to me, if you were able to see what God sees and see it in the larger picture in which he is working, you would choose exactly what has been happening to you. While we may never get full understanding or answers in this life, we can find something even more important, and that's the presence of God. He comes to our side so that even though the circumstances of the moment may seem unbearable, his presence will carry us through. In the midst of it all, there is given his promise of the kingdom of God. That's the time and place when the Lord will rule and all things will be put right. But how could Jesus tell us to rejoice in the midst of pain and persecution? It seems so contrary to all we would expect. And surely it's different for each individual who faces such testing. But I find help in the writing of two of my heroes from history. In the second century, Justin was a young philosopher who became a follower of Christ. Persecution against Christians was intense, and Justin wrote his first apology, or defense of the faith. He wrote it to the emperor, Antonius Pius. There, Justin set forth his amazing convictions and confidence and sent it to the most powerful man in the world at the time. He said to the emperor, you can kill us, but you cannot hurt us. Justin was beheaded in the year 165 AD, but he knew his life and the well-being of the church was so secure in the ultimate purposes of God and his kingdom that they did not need to fear even the might of the Roman Empire and the prospect of death. 
or hear Albert Delp, a pastor in Munich, Germany. He spoke out against the Nazi regime. He was arrested, tortured, imprisoned, and then executed February 2nd, 1945, tragically, just weeks before the end of the war. In the weeks before his death, he testified through his journal, smuggled out of prison, these amazing words. It does happen, even under these circumstances, that every now and then, my whole being is flooded with pulsating life, and my heart can scarcely contain the delirious joy that is in it. Suddenly, without any cause that I can perceive, without knowing why or by what right, my spirit soar again, and there's not a doubt in my mind that all the promises hold good. Outwardly, nothing has changed. The hopelessness of the situation remains only too obvious, yet one can face it undismayed. One is content to leave everything in God's hands, and that is the whole point. Happiness in this life is inextricably mixed with God. In the lives of both Justin Mater and Albert Delp, we see tranquility and joy even in the midst of unjust suffering. Our final beatitude assures us that even in the most difficult situations, blessedness may still be found. Their testimonies show how they already could taste what's promised in the beatitude, that theirs is the kingdom of God. Now in our final segment, we'll look at a key ingredient for anyone or everyone eager to find that same blessedness. For final thoughts on the Beatitudes, I had to visit this church at Ebelin. That's in Galilee, the region where Jesus grew up. The church is part of the ancient Greek Melkite church, and it's beautifully themed and built around the Beatitudes. See how the Beatitudes are engraved in multiple languages on the stairs to the entrance? Inside, we're surrounded by scenes that illustrate the Beatitudes from the Gospel stories about Jesus. The pastor, Elias Shakur, is a Palestinian Christian and an archbishop of his church. He planned the building that way as he's passionately convinced that the Beatitudes are the key to peace in the strife-torn Holy Land. From the base of this church, he's built a school with an enrollment of over 4,000. His courageous ministry has been detailed in the now classic book, Blood Brothers. Twice he's been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. The ministry here, quietly and profoundly, point to that open secret of how the Beatitudes can change individual lives and society. They vividly remind us that there is another way. Preparing this program, it really frustrated me to see how the Beatitudes are so rich, and yet I could never hope to explore their whole meaning. And frankly, perhaps not even the main meaning. Our task was particularly to relate to those dealing with cancer, and that meant bypassing so much of the depth that the Beatitudes represent, and I know that. But let's come back to our purpose. Do you recall at the beginning, I said that we sought to find blessedness out of our brokenness? Well, frankly, there's more. What I was really aiming at is to find blessedness out of our brokenness and fulfill our mission, even living with cancer, in a broken body, in a broken world. I was hesitant to say all that at the beginning because, after all, how do you urge people with cancer to find and fulfill a mission in life? For many, just getting through the day 
in the present pain is already overwhelming enough. As I related earlier, last winter, in my latest rounds of cancer treatment, they left me so weak day after day that I often thought it foolish to take out my own mission, a mission that included planning for these programs. But I couldn't escape the conviction that if you're alive, you still have a mission. And recall how Dr. Balducci reminded us earlier, it is something only you can fulfill. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to fulfill all we hope for and dream about for this life. Indeed, if we did, I suspect it probably would mean our hopes and dreams were way too small. But we can still have a mission, even when we feel we have so little left to work with. The statesman, Edmund Burke, said it so well. Nobody made a greater mistake than he who did nothing because he could only do a little. Our remaining mission may be as simple as a grateful word or even a gentle smile to those ministering to us, even if we're flat on our back. Have you found your mission for the days, however many or few they may be, that remain for you? In the film Australia, a wealthy socialite who's in danger of losing all her wealth and property is told this. In the end, the only thing we really own is our story. Indeed, our story, our own unique, irreplaceable, unduplicatable story is all we're going to end up with and take with us from this life. And I think our story is best summed up in our unique mission. Now, for me, cancer meant a very stark and simple choice. Would I respond to it as a curse or a calling? And as best I knew how, I accepted it as a calling. And that meant accepting whatever mission in life remained for me. And though I have never been so ground down at times and several times actually dangerously dangled over the precipice, through it all, in a strange way, I can honestly tell you, I've never been more blessed or joy-filled. As we come to the end of our program, I have to confess that I think I sometimes end up with more questions than answers, but I think that can be good. That is, if the questions are good. And the best question, I believe, was expressed so well by St. Teresa. That was almost 500 years ago. She asked God, what do you want of me? Now, she was not seeking information for negotiation. She was seeking understanding for experience. In my better days, I try to sincerely pray her prayer. For me, it seems to swoop in, gather up the Beatitudes, and join them together, and call forth a response that embodies the blessedness, the happiness that we've been gazing upon together in this program. Let me leave you with part of her prayer. I am yours, and for you I was born. What do you want from me? I am yours because you created me, yours because you redeemed me, yours because you bore with me, yours because you called me to you, yours because you also waited for me and did not have me condemned. What do you want from me? See, here is my heart. I place it in your hand, together with my life, my body, and my soul, my inmost feelings, and my love. Since I have given myself to you, what do you want from me? Give me life or death, health or sickness. Give me honor or dishonor conflict or sublime peace. 
weakness or full strength. I will accept it all. What do you want from me? If you want me to rejoice, then out of love for you, I will rejoice. If you lay burdens upon me, then I shall want to die bearing them. Tell me where, when, and how. Just tell me, what do you want from me? Let me be in the midst of trouble or of joy. If you will only live in me, what do you want from me? I am yours, and for you I was born. What do you want from me? My friends, my guess is that we are best prepared to ask God, what do you want from me? Only after we've caught a glimpse of what God wants for me. And isn't that exactly what the Beatitudes are all about? Is not what God wants for us that strange, unexpected, and wonderful blessedness that is so beautifully set forth in the priceless and inexhaustible words of the Beatitudes that we have been contemplating together? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. <laughs>